Good afternoon and morning or evening. My name is Gwenai Luc. I am working for FAO Office of Emergency and Resilience as a Global Food Security Cluster Specialist. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second event of, in this area on food and nutrition education and livelihood support in emergency and resilience program. This webinar is part of a joint initiative promoted by the Food and Nutrition Division and the CORI, the Knowledge Sharing Platform of the Office of Emergency and Resilience at the FAO, with the objective to document and share knowledge on country experiences in nutrition and resilience. This event is also the 30th webinar organized by CORI. Today's webinar was made possible through support provided by the European Union under the partnership program contributing to the global network against food crisis. This webinar is part of a new webinar series on food and nutrition education in emergency and resilience program. The webinar findings will be used to identify the essential component of food and nutrition education intervention and the required planning step that are appropriate and feasible for emergency program. The webinar will last one and a half hour and being recorded and the recording will be shared after the event. Please use the chat box to leave comments and ask questions. Before I pass the floor to our speakers, let me say a few words about the importance of today's topic. Food and nutrition education combined with livelihood support is practiced in several documented experiences. Given the potential of this practice to be used in a large number of countries, this webinar builds on experiences from Somalia and Niger and on technical expertise to, dis to discuss basic steps to develop effective food and nutrition education embedded in with livelihood support programming. Against this background, this webinar series specifically aims to discuss the appropriate steps to combine food and nutrition education with livelihood support in the emergency program. Today, we have the pleasure to count on the presence of three speakers. Anna Hisla Ramos, Nutrition Officer at FAO, Emma Uma, Nutrition Officer for FAO Kenya, and Isa Ibrahima, Food Security and Livelihood Coordinator for Action Against Hunger, Action Contre la Faim in Niger. After the presentation by today's speaker, we will have a debate facilitated by Darana Souza, Nutrition and Food System Officer at FAO. And now I'm going to pass the floor to Anaisla Ramos, who will tell us about the key element for success of effective food and nutrition education in emergency program. Anna, over to you, thanks. Thank you so much, Wenel. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation to this webinar. Um, so uh, I would like to um, acknowledge also my team in the preparation of these slides. Uh, especially Ramani, who is in the audience. Thank you, Ramani Vijusinga Betoni. Um, so uh, talking about the effective food and nutrition education interventions in short-term um, food security and livelihood programs, key elements for success. So this uh, presentation will entail, first, why do food and nutrition education in emergency contexts? Uh, second, how can food and nutrition education help in these contexts? How to plan effective food and nutrition and education interventions? And uh, especially, obviously, in this context, and then conclusions. Um, so before I uh, address why in emergency context, I would like you to all please in the chat, uh, only write yes or no if you participated in the resilience workshop. So I can see how uh, many of you uh, really are aware of what was uh, addressed in that, uh, in that uh, webinar uh, two weeks ago. Thank you. Just a yes or no is, is, is enough. Thanks a lot. In the chat. And now a quiz. Uh, for those of you who participated, um, uh, 
maybe you know which, and those who do, did not participate, maybe you know which of the following could be criteria of success for food and nutrition education. What do you think could be um, criteria for success for food and nutrition education? And you have some options in front of you in the poll. Um, the first is on sustained improvement in dietary practices. The second, dietary changes that are co cost effective or um, uh, that the food and nutrition education has a breeder effect. That is that learning can be passed to others. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer, please. Thank you. Okay, I can see that uh, some answers are coming in, um, some in the chat, but you also should have a pop up in front of you. Okay. Thank you. Can you please put the results if we have enough results at this time? Okay, so uh, sustained improvement in dietary practices can definitely be. Uh, most of you answered that and that is correct. Dietary changes that are cost effective can definitely be and that is correct and have a breeder effect uh, uh, that learning can be passed to others can definitely be, and that is also correct. So those three can all be criteria for uh, food, effective food and nutrition education. Um, so I think uh, we have a very knowledgeable audience today. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, most of you know, and I guess all of you know, I don't have to tell you that in emergencies, um, uh, it, there is a call for a range of responses to effectively assist affected communities to prepare, to avoid risky practices, reestablish positive behaviors and recover. So how can F, uh, food and nutrition education, f &E, help in food security and livelihoods programs? Well, uh, one of the things uh, that when food and nutrition education is well designed, it can help in these programs by uh, helping people better adapt to changing or changed contexts. Uh, there, of, of course, is a difference between the different stages of an emergency context, the, the preparedness, of course, beforehand, where uh, any acquired skills from food and nutrition education may be transfer, uh, transferable to the changing context. But then also, of course, um, in the acute phase is a bit more difficult, uh, actually quite more difficult, but then in a protracted crisis, it becomes necessary to also address um, uh, skills and, and support people with uh, knowledge that the situation is still very dire on the ground, but in, with a view of making it uh, better uh, and, uh, and supporting uh, resilience of those populations. Then it could also, uh, food and nutrition education, uh, promote the reestablishment of, of non-emergency behaviors because, of course, as soon during the acute phase, some behaviors may um, may surface that may cause uh, problems down the road, um, and so in this in this particular context. Uh, it brings, uh, it can bring some sense of going back and supporting uh, this uh, these recovery. And um, in the third space is also providing a safe space where, where people can discuss and do a, in group settings. It can support social, mental, and emotional health as well as nutrition outcomes. So, um, those three are th three ways that uh, food and nutrition education can help in these contexts. Regarding how to plan effective food and nutrition education interventions, my colleague Ramani already presented this, so I will focus mainly on how this applies to emergency contexts and food security and livelihood programs. 
So um, in this case, uh, just as a, a recalling what uh, my colleague Ramani presented, uh, at, we have a first stage where we uh, uh, get to know who are the different stakeholders and uh, invite them to be part of the program design. And then we have the participatory formative research that is very critical. Um, then uh, designing it, the, the program itself, carrying out capacity development, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating. But in particular, in the different air, uh, times when, when we are dealing with these uh, changing situations, it may be that we have tight deadlines for program design. So this needs to be done in a very, um, in a very uh, lean and, and uh, straightforward way, this you know already. Um, and also, as well as with other programs, we need, it's good uh, practice to uh, re get to know and rely on existing community platforms that, and if available. Um, and a, an acute uh, knowledge of the situation of the ground is necessary, but in particular for food and nutrition education, the behavioral issues that have to do with what people uh, um, are facing in terms of food security issues, but also food, food and nutrition um, uh, behaviors that they may be uh, relying upon, uh, it's also uh, quite important. Um, and uh, it, this situation may change, uh, and as it change, it becomes it, uh, important to have an iterative process so that food and nutrition education continues to respond to the context, and this is critical. Then when we have uh, participatory formative research, which is the knowledge of this uh, situation in the ground, um, uh, we had some questions that my colleague Romani shared uh, in the previous uh, presentation, like what are the main food and nutrition problems? Uh, nutrition problems, it may take time for them to, to change. It may take time to be, them become worse or better um, in, in particular, but the food situation may, uh, may change drastically very quickly. And therefore, that's where I was saying this iterative process becomes very important. And this um, participatory research is also quite important. Um, then uh, in terms of the practices that contribute to these pro problems may also change. The behaviors, of course, become adaptive. And that, that is uh, where formative research to identify these target competencies is, is becomes also quite important. Um, and um, uh, then also, what would be these healthy and sustainable existing practices that could be promoted with the context where we are? There, there may be very li limited um, uh, possibilities of what can be promoted in a realistic way. And uh, then what food practices should be prioritized as food and nutrition education um, target competences then would be uh, changing uh, also, and therefore this iterative process again. What are the influences of existing uh, food practices, outlooks and decisions among individuals and families? Um, and then what would be barriers to change? And again, all of these things could change um, quickly. So when we arrive at the design um, of effective programs, we have, uh, again, uh, it's good to have a behavioral focus so that all of the objectives of the nutrition education are behaviorally focused. It's also important that these are theory-based with learning models, learning pathways and approaches, and that these activities uh, be guided by the chosen model. Uh, but in, especially in emergency context, the human and financial resources can be difficult to, to, to obtain and to get. And for human resources, again, someone who, uh, getting people that are really very knowledgeable of the, of the context in the ground, the, the behaviors, the people and the constraints that people are facing is very critical. And um, 
So um, when we carry out uh, capacity development, again, this is context specific and it has to be addressing the changing situation depending on what is needed at the time, uh, making sure that we address first the priority needs and uh, have also um, addressing these rapidly changing behaviors. One other thing that I think it's critical um, in the, at this time, in emergency situation, these priority needs may not have anything to do with nutrition. Um, uh, and, and there may be a context where the, the, uh, the target population may be very anxious. And uh, learning in this context becomes very, very difficult um, because people have other things in their minds. So uh, providing a safe space and trying to address the emotional um, issues that people are facing in, in, uh, or at least trying to assuage them for, for a while while the nutrition education is taking place, um, it would be also quite important in this, in this context. And again, um, when we implement, then we have we rely on existing community pr uh, platforms if, if they are existing, if they are available. Um, and uh, but the, this is important that we always focus on the behaviors um, that uh, that are being um, pra practiced at the time. Um, Again, innovation is very critical because of the situation that is changing um, and how to deliver and test what is being done to see how, what is effective and what is working. So continuous testing and continuous and, and see if, if things are working and if things are really addressing what, con what people are facing is, is, is quite important um, to identify things that work. Uh, then um, the, in some cases, uh, uh, household food production is being, is being also um, recommended and, and it, it can uh, provide uh, some needed food security and diversity for nutrition. However, in, some, in other cases, this becomes unpracticable uh, because of just the, the transient nature of these migrant populations in some cases, and and the uh, um, the access to land and 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 those kind of things. So so that is one of the things that might be um, um, uh, considered. And then of course, very very important to continue having uh, beneficiary feedback. Ways that things that can be done always uh, as usual. We have different media and different ways where food, food and nutrition education can take place. And again, um, having face-to-face -face contact in a context that is not necessarily, um, that, that builds community is also one of the benefits of, of having food and nutrition education, talking something about food can be also, and, and, uh, and for displaced populations, um, recalling and, and, and uh, discussing the, the issues that they have uh, faced and the foods that they, they can acquire in their new situation, in their new context can be also a way of, of uh, addressing some uh, mental and uh, um, emotional issues. And uh, finally, monitoring and evaluation uh, is, uh, again, very critical. The monitoring aspect is, is particularly important so that we measure the results of any intervention that we're having to the, during this emergency and recovery and uh, accumulate the learning on what is working and what is not, as I was mentioning. And then, of course, evaluation um, becomes also very critical to, uh, um, and uh, in this case for food and nutrition education, the, the actual recording of this and, and uh, publication is also quite important. So, um, just on some topics that uh, have uh, in some of the, uh, um, the research that has emerged that are normally covered in these kind of food and nutrition education um, in the in emergency context is uh, in 
most commonly infant and common and formula you for infant formula use uh, infant and young child feeding practices water sanitation and hygiene as well as continued feeding of children during uh, illness however um, some other uh, uh, definitely also touch on infections, disease management, and food safety. So in conclusion, and my takeaway messages is that well-designed food and nutrition education can be valuable in emergency contexts to help people better adapt to the changed context or changing context. It can also pro provide um, and promote the reestablishment of non-emergency behaviors, build community, and support social, mental, and emotional health, as well as nutrition outcomes. Thank you so much. Uh, here is my contact information, and I will leave with you also for the presentation, the references. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, for this excellent presentation. And now we can take some questions from the audience. We have one, uh, Anna, for you. Uh, what are some examples of nutrition-sensitive agriculture activity that can be done to strengthen the food safety you just mentioned in uh, emergency settings? Thanks. So in terms of uh, food safety, definitely some of the issues that uh, depending on what the water situation is, uh, of course, um, in, in agriculture, uh, when water is, is not uh, safe, it becomes very, very difficult to ensure that, that uh, crops that will be consumed are irrigated with safe water and that, uh, that also uh, uh, practices after uh, after um, uh, harvest and and in the preparation of these foods, if, if these are being to, uh, uh, produced for home consumption for household consumption, that these these are safe. So that's one of the critical aspects. But then, of course, depending if there are also animals in the household um, and livestock uh, practices. Uh, in emergency situations, it may be difficult to um, to separate and and effectively uh, rear animals in a way that it may it, it could um, contaminate other foods in a way that it may not be safe. So so th those two things I would say are probably the main um, issues that would be important to address in agriculture. Um, settings and and uh, depending on, on on what it is that you are facing in the ground thank you so much anna so uh, i guess now uh, i am going to pass the floor to emma uma nutrition advisor at fl kenya um emma this is uh, good afternoon good morning everybody so I'm Emma Uma, I support FAO Somalia, um, and I want to share with you um, our experience with integrating nutrition education um, and food safety education. Okay, so with FAO Somalia, one of the largest interventions that we do in terms of supporting households, vulnerable households in the emergency context is by providing them with cash. So cash is very big, it's very large in, in uh, its delivery. And in FAO Somalia, we can combine the cash with a livelihood input package. So for um, the agriculture, for the agricultural livelihood, we provide a seed package. And this seed package is uh, maize, sorghum, cowpeas, as well as eight different types of fruits and vegetables. We also have other inputs such as fertilizers, tools, tractor hours, irrigation, storage bags uh, that are all provided to these vulnerable households and also capacity strengthening on good agricultural practices or nutrition. And specifically for nutrition, uh, emphasis is made on how they can maximize the utilization of this package that is provided. We also have the Cash Plus Livestock Package. For the livestock package they're provided with um, range cubes. So these range cubes are very nutrient dense, very high in protein. So the purpose of this is so that we can boost the production of milk and also the milk and the meat quality of the livestock. 
They're also provided with treatment for 10 um, sheep and goats. So deworming is provided, treatment of any diseases. And we also have trainings on livestock management, as well as um, nutrition education. The main focus for this one for nutrition education is that we provide trainings and um, sensitization on milk and meat handling at the household level. So once they milk or uh, they milk their livestock, how do they treat that milk or meat so that it is uh, not contaminated? We also have the Cash Plus Fisheries Package, which comes in three different packages, the boat package for those who go to farm at the sea, um, the community processing package, which is provided to uh, women as well as the youth, and we also have the, the third one is a household package. So women are provided with uh, simple cooking kits so that they're able to cook the fish for their families. The training depends on which package they're receiving. So the, for the boat package, the training is mainly focused on uh, fishing techniques, safety at sea, handling of the fish at sea. Uh, for nutrition education, which is also provided to all these groups, we look at how they handle the fish so that we maintain it's safety for consumption at the household level. Uh, we do cooking demonstrations and we do uh, a lot of uh, sensitization on the nutrition benefits of, of fish. Despite the fact that Somalia has the largest coastline, there's still a lot of work that needs to go into promoting consumption of fish within the household in Somalia. In terms of targeting, we target IPC three and four, which is in, in crisis. So um, this is uh, how we identify the most vulnerable populations. We go in and uh, we have now introduced a different layer, which is very nutrition sensitive. Outside of going to IPC three and four, we now come in and look at which are the most, uh, the villages with the highest rates of malnutrition. Uh, we target female headers households. We target households with children less than five and households with pregnant and lactating women. So this is how one of the uh, strategies that we are employing to make sure that our intervention and our support is very nutrition sensitive. So for nutrition education, so I'll just take you through how we arrived at having nutrition education that has been mainstreamed throughout the delivery of our cash uh, plus livelihoods assistance. So the main purpose, of having the cash plus livelihood assistance was for us to be able to uh, in influence the dietary habits and the patterns of the people of Somalia. We wanted to sensitize the beneficiaries so that they can get maximum output in terms of um, health and nutrition from the inputs that we were providing. We also wanted to promote sustainable diets, uh, despite the fact that it is an emergency content we still have um, foods that are available during these seasons. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, the communities and the most vulnerable are aware of what is actually available locally and also contribute to the nutrition cluster's objective of preventing malnutrition. Um, recently, there was a meeting and you can see with the, with the challenges of funding that the priority is still, um, has, is now not shifting, but treatment of malnutrition is being prioritized. So this is an opportunity for FAO to come in and support households which are border, borderline or suffering from moderate acute malnutrition. Um, so the development of these tools was done in two main steps. The first step was for us to identify different entry points. What are the needs in terms of um, knowledge in terms in, on nutrition, uh, on food handling, on uh, food, different foods that are available locally within Somalia. So we did a gap analysis to identify as well what tools are available within Somali context? There's a lot of nutrition that is going on, particularly within the health sector. So we needed to understand what, what is the messaging and what can we adopt and adapt within the materials that we wanted to use. So we were not reinventing the wheel. So for example, in terms of um, exclusive breastfeeding, infant and young child feeding, we did not want to start preaching a different message. So we simply took the messages that were already being used and incorporated it into what we were developing. We had a lot of consultations, particularly with our local partners who have been supporting the delivery of livelihood assistance within Somalia. We had a lot of consultations with the nutrition cluster and that's how we came up with the priority areas for the messaging. So we developed and designed the first draft um, that was reviewed and um, was ready for pretesting. So the second stage was the institutionalization because we did not want this material or the messages 
to just be FAO led. We wanted to have different people participate in the finalization and the review of the messaging. And so we created what is the steering committee. We had different ministries, health, agriculture, livestock, fisheries, um, scaling up nutrition together with its networks. We had um, the nutrition cluster, the civil society, all participate in this steering committee. Uh, we had several consultations and during the pretest, some of these steering committee members went out to the field to actually see the pretest being done, the trainings being done for the partners, the trainings being done for the community. And there was a lot, a lot of overwhelming feedback, which we really did our best to integrate and to make sure that the tool was as context specific as possible. We vetted everything to the color of eggs, to the color of oranges as represented in the tools and the materials. So this was uh, finally launched at the end of um, 2019 and it was ready for use for 2020. So we did develop a lot of tools. We have the facilitator's guide, which is the, uh, takes a TOT approach. And this targets the partners, implementing partners on the ground who are carrying out livelihood programs. So there's a lot that, that um, they can learn from this, even in terms of the delivery, uh, providing supportive supervision to uh, those we call nutrition champions on the ground. Uh, we also have the nutrition champions booklet. So the nutrition champions booklet is generally a simplified version of the facilitator's guide because what we do is that we train nutrition champions in the community because um, you realize that within Somalia, despite the fact that there is widespread malnutrition and there's a lot of treatment, we still don't have um, the coverage being very high. So in very many places that are targeted by, targeted by FAA, which are rural areas, we still do not have community health workers. So by establishing nutrition champions and training them, we're able to leave them with uh, the knowledge, the information within the community, and they can train and share information as needed. Uh, we also have a booklet for community members, very simple, very easy to understand. Uh, it uses very simple Somali that can be understood across uh, the country. Uh, in spite of the different dialects from the different regions. Uh, we also have counseling cards which are used in a seasonal calendar, which helps them map out the different foods that are available during the different seasons. Uh, in terms of uh, the modules and the main messaging, uh, we have feeding your family, which looks at a life cycle approach. We look at uh, from the beginning to the end, uh, from conception until when someone is elderly, what are the different nutrition needs? We look at food preparation, food storage. Uh, we also have food safety and hygiene, which I mentioned before, dives into milk and meat hygiene. Um, and we also have water sanitation and, and hygiene. So this is just an overview of the modules, although we have a breakdown of different topics. Um, and this is delivered one module per session so that they have time to discuss um, everything that is within a specific module. Um, during the COVID-19, we were unable to really go out into, onto the ground and do the trainings in large groups uh, because of the restrictions. So we, we complemented this by having a radio show. The radio show had nine episodes, all extracted from the three different modules. We had technical experts participate uh, within the different radio sessions. We had audiences having the ability, um, being allowed to call in and ask questions. And this uh, radio show was also translated into three different dialects to cover the whole of Somalia. We also had a complimentary YouTube video that was developed together with um, Innovation Lab and the Nutrition Cluster. And this was targeting uh, mostly the urban areas because of, in the context of COVID-19, it was very important for us as FAO to share messaging on um, managing your diet during the COVID situation. The strategy for delivering the nutrition education um, within Somalia is that we do train our focal points within uh, partner organizations. So we go through an intensive uh, one to two week training on what is exactly expected of them as focal points, as people will go into the community and disseminate information on nutrition. And these focal points are then uh, then go to the communities. They select those who we call nutrition champions, as I had mentioned, and they ensure that the nutrition champion have the ability and the capacity to share this nutrition information at the community level. 
the nutrition champions are provided with supportive supervision as they train the beneficiaries because emergency projects are only six months. So we make sure that they have um, enough contact with the beneficiaries and that by the end of the project that they are able to train them conclusively and they have the ability to you know, share the information even after the project period has lapsed. The beneficiaries are also encouraged to share this information with, with you know, their family members, their friends, so that the information on uh, nutrition can be disseminated to a larger group who may benefit from it. So for 2020, we managed to train 696 nutrition champions. Uh, we trained 19,000 beneficiaries. Um, and we also managed to start the, the first time to collect uh, dietary diversity and nutrition related indicators for specifically for the project. So it was for the dare season the, or under the crop yield assessment, the monitoring and evaluation team collected data on the minimum dietary diversity for women. And it was found to be at 57%, which is much higher than um, the, national, the national level. So to share what has worked for FAO Somalia so far, we still continue to learn, but what has worked so far is that we have a, bu a budget and staff dedicated to delivering the nutrition education throughout the, uh, the cash emergency program. And this has been very beneficial because we do not have any back and forth and we have a focal person to make sure the delivery is done and it's done properly. There's a lot of buy-in from the staff, um, the government, who support the emergency program as well as FAO partners. And this has been because we do continuous sensitization and make sure that they are aware of all the advances and all the changes that we're making. And we also continue to improve the delivery. So we, we, we introduced the nutrition indicators. Uh, the targeting was revised so that it can be more nutrition sensitive. So we are slowly making pro progress based on what we are learning. At a community level, to keep um, all beneficiaries interested, particularly from a livelihood perspective. We, we embraced a life cycle approach. So this made us look into all the nutrition needs of all members of a household, not only the children under five and the pregnant and lactating women. So everybody was included. And, and this has brought a lot of discussions and interest into learning more about what the nutrition needs of the household are and how the nutrition needs can be accessed. Um, improved by what is available at Somalia. The nutrition uh, champions are a great resource because even in the emergency context, once we leave and finalize our project, we still leave resources in terms of knowledge, in the community. Uh, we focused on needs and the context of Somalia. So the messaging was tailored and we made sure that it addresses the needs to the team. Um, and then there's the slow introduction of cooking demonstrations within the context of Somalia. Um, where there's floods and continuous droughts, we wanted to make sure that the modality of delivery for the cooking demonstration really takes into account food safety so that we are not putting anybody in harm's way. Uh, challenges, uh, we have had great, great challenges, although we are working to advocate for an expenditure basket that accounts for uh, the micronutrient needs of the community. We've had to have trade-offs between um, culture and best practice. Because if you look at the seed package, they might not necessarily be um, the most nutrient dense, for example, in terms of iron. But we had to look at what, what do the Somalis consume and make sure that the package, because it's a short term project, the package can still address the nutrition needs within reason. Um, and as well as nutrition education not being uh, one of uh, priorities within the food security and the agriculture sector, um, this, this has been a challenge, but I'm, I'm glad to report that we are moving in the right direction since at the beginning of this year, we managed to train a uh, training of trainers who are based within the Ministry of Agriculture. And nutrition is largely considered a health issue in Somalia, but and that is something that we're working to change and make sure that the footprint of agriculture and uh, food security is felt in nutrition for us. Uh, recommendations, we would like to advocate that we build a national level commitment in ensuring that nutrition education is delivered with, with um, uh, a majority, if not all of the livelihood interventions. And we also need to focus on building an evidence base on the different kinds of models and modalities of um, cash assistance that 
incorporate a livelihood package in corporate nutrition education and see uh, what kind of uh, results that gains. Um, we also need to ensure that we have a budget allocated for nutrition education because nutrition education is uh, needs to be accounted for in terms of ensuring that we are able to um, have the nutrition education uh, session somewhere where it's conducive and comfortable for the participants, um, that if they need transport to go back to where they're going to, that is also catered for. And we also need to design short-term and long-term uh, nutrition targeted uh, cash assistance that uh, basically targets households that are let up, left out of treatment and uh, feeding assistance. Thank you. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Emma, for this very interesting presentation. We have several questions in the chat for you, so I will raise one of them and uh, the, the rest of them will be um, uh, raised at the end of the third session during the question and answer session. Thanks. So we have one question for you, Emma, uh, from Ramani uh, Betoni. Uh, regarding the community champions, how are they selected? Can you give us some example of who were the champions and do they need to be provided with incentives to participate? Thanks. Good, thanks Romani for the question. So um, the nutrition champions are selected from the pool of beneficiaries that FAO select. So the selection of, of beneficiaries is very consultative. Uh, we have a lot of consultations that goes into it, speaking with the village, the, the village elders, um, speaking with the mayors, etc., uh, so that we can be able to sensitize the community on what exactly the project is about. Um, and I just want to share the primary target for the project is uh, on food security and livelihoods and not uh, nutrition. So nutrition is just something that we have integrated. They're selected um, through uh, we have a selection criteria. So the selection criteria looks at the cultural context to make sure that both men and women are able to participate. So for one, we have one male and one female. We select uh, ben, uh, nutrition champions who can be able to read because we provide uh, literature and documents, the nutrition champions booklet, um, the counseling cards, all of which need someone who's able to read. And we also request for the focal point in, in addition to other selection criteria, for the focal point to be uh, continuously in touch during the, the beneficiary selection process so that they are able to identify those who seem to be a most vocal, most interested in disseminating information, um, interested in making sure that the community is uplifted in, in terms of their situation. So th those are some of the uh, selection criteria we, that we use, but we do have a very well articulated selection criteria that is used by our partner to select champions in the community. So they are also not provided with a specific incentive. They are beneficiaries of the project. So they do get the cash and they do get the livelihood package. Thank you so much, uh, Emma. I will now pass the floor to uh, Issa Ibrahima from uh, Action Contre la Faim, Action Against Hunger uh, in Niger. He's the Food Security and Livelihood Coordinator. Um, Issa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to to say thank you to the organizers, organizers of this webinar and for giving us the opportunity to talk about our experience in food and nutrition education, even if it is in emergency situations. And also mention that Action Against Hunger is settled in Niger since uh, 1997 and is running programs of food security and livelihood, health and nutrition, water, sanitation, and hygiene. And we are also having some programs of advocacy. So as you can see, we are working in many areas, both of them sensitive to nutrition. So this theme we are debating on is 
is coming from our, st our various studies and evaluations who show out the importance of uh, having, of changing behavior in terms, uh, changing behavior in the community and also a change of practices if we expect to, to fight against uh, malnutrition. And like what you can see next, you see Niger, we have, uh, we are over in terms of uh, malnutrition rates, the global acute malnut uh, the global acute malnutrition is about above 12.2, and the severe acute malnutrition is above uh, two. So it means that we have a great number of population suffering from malnutrition. That's why we have conducted some studies and evaluations to better analyze what are the root causes of this malnutrition, like the NCA, nutrition causal analysis, and also barrier analysis. Both of them show that community must change in terms of behavior and also in terms of, uh, in terms of practice. So that's what we are going to see next. So our approach for food and nutrition education is based on our multisectoriality because all the programs we are running, we are trying our best to do them in a given area so that we can have much impact on the nutrition. And we have a cross-cutting program, which is community mobilization. So, and this is in all of our projects, though it should be noted that over more than 70% of our programs can be our short term programs. So we are almost always running in emergencies and we cannot say that because the, our programs are not long term programs that we are not going to tackle uh, the the, the cause of this malnutrition in terms of community mobilization. As we are going to see, we have a full department of community mobilization to, which is in, in charge of educating people in terms of nutrition. And we have uh, at community level, what we call a uh, relay communautaire. And uh, we also have at this office some, some staffs of ACF who are uh, working with the relay communautaire in terms of sensitization. And we have a mobilization coordinator in, uh, based at the coordination of Action Against Hunger who is coordinating all the aspect of education in nutrition and make sure that Every single, uh, every single project we are doing contains aspects of uh, community education uh, about nutrition. Specifically for the programs of food security and livelihood who are not, uh, I mean, uh, they are very nutrition sensitive. They are very nutrition sensitive. Next. So we have the synergies between livelihood support and food nutrition education. We have uh, group sessions on distribution. Like I said, when we are running safety net programs like cash for work or food distribution, we carry out at the same time nutritional education for the population so that they can better use what we give them in terms of money or in terms of food and that they should understand uh, also what that we are doing is to tackle the, the malnutrition of uh, children among them. Yes. So we have models like, like I said, it's not 
only a matter of changing behavior. <clears throat> it is also a matter of changing practice because now we are facing the impact of uh, climate change. So we are sensitizing people and we are helping them to change their food, pro their food production practices like we, we train them in agroecology, how they are going to produce, to, uh, how they are going to make their production more sensitive to nutrition. So, and uh, also we, we have uh, an approach which is the, the farmers field schools. So it, they are like demonstration, demonstration fields at the community level. And uh, we train people inside these field schools on the new techniques of uh, growing crops and also how to use uh, not chemic organic, organic fertilizers to have a good production and to, to improve their production again. Okay. Apart from that, we have initiated the aspect of uh, support groups. So the support groups are what we call caregivers made up of uh, mothers. We have mother groups and grandmothers, fathers, community health workers, and traditional birth attendants. So all these groups, we sensitize them, we, we train them to give education in nutrition at the community level, at their level, because we think that there are people that the beneficiaries or the community listen to them, see? So that's what we call uh, infant and youth child uh, groups, uh, support group. We have also what we call husband school. So husband school are uh, model men. They are not uh, the rich ones or the poor ones. They are ju just some husbands that are very, that show concern, their concern about malnutrition. So these, uh, these husbands uh, are identified and trained so that on the turn, once they are back to home, they can carry out uh, community education towards nutrition in order to improve child nutrition. They are volunteers, community volunteers, and we, we base on them to best educate people to take care of nutrition, mostly for the children. Yeah. But like uh, all programs, we have many challenges because we are uh, working in a multi-sectoral way, uh, combining food security, health and nutrition, water sanitation in a same in the same community, in the same uh, area. So we have the challenge of coordination and monitoring um, among the different programs. And also the other challenge we have is the capacity to mobilize uh, multisectoral funding. As you, you know, many of the, the founders have their, uh, their way it's it's very difficult to have fund to that can allow us to undertake multisectoral programs for the population sustainability and community ownership many of uh, the evaluations and uh, studies show that all this dynamic of including the community may stop by the time uh, the project stop because there's no incentives the people might stop also what we have uh, so far done with them incorporate mental health and psychological support yes this is very not new aspect for us but we are trying also to to make this 
mental health and social support very important in the program as you know the context of niger many people have trauma like uh, in the eastern part of niger uh, Difa, people affected by the crisis of boko haram and in the western part also we have people affected by the crisis but it's not it's very difficult to to engage people fighting against malnutrition when they have trauma of insecurity so we are trying our best to include these uh, and incorporate also mental health and uh, and psychological support for the population so that they can better understand and work with what we we educate to do in terms of nutrition fighting yes so this the come to end of my presentation but apart from the community the community relays we also try to work with the social media network so that they can uh, the, the social media network activists about malnutrition so that they can uh, educate people to towards the question of nutrition in niger and uh, we also have a a network of journalists sensitive to to nutrition we also sensitize them so that they can relay the message to a wider uh, wider audience so thank you very much thank you so much isa for this excellent presentation uh, i think we have also uh, some question in the chat let me raise one of them um is it possible to connect the emergency program to long-term one, at least to improve livelihoods? What do you think? Okay. Yes, it is, it is possible to build on uh, what we have acquired. Because we always start with emergency programs and we progress to, to more short-term programs. What I say is like the next is emergency first, then uh, recovery, then you step on development, but always make sure that you are building on what we have, uh, what you have acquired during the emergency program. We stabilize people, then you can sensitize them, then you can move to recovery and furthermore to development programs. I think that it is very possible. Thank but you the so great much. challenge about this is in some emergencies, we are in the context of Niger, we have refugees, we have uh, IDPs, and uh, also we have returnees. For this very specific category of people, it is very hard to move from emergency to development because you don't know, they may return back to where they are from at any time. So, but if the population is stable, yes, you can move from emergency to development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Issa. So uh, let me now pass the floor to Darana Souza, Nutrition and Food System Officer at FAO to facilitate the debate. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Bernal, and thanks, um, the presenters. And we have good questions in the chat. Um, please feel free to continue asking them or putting your comments there. We will continue from there. Um, I'd like to start with this last question that um, was asked um, also to Isa and take the opportunity to ask this to Emma as well. Um, Emma, in your experience, um, how is it possible to connect the short term emergency programs with longer term programming. And then in that case, what happened to the food and nutrition education component? Was it um, integrated in both? Over. Yeah, we, we do have one that is being piloted right now, which is uh, the long term cash assistance. So the beneficiaries are provided with uh, small amounts of money uh, every month and they are provided with livelihood packages based on their, their, you know, the livelihood where they come from and nutrition education is also embedded in that delivery. 
so it is it is a longer term kind of assistance that supports uh, the emergency context. Um, at the same time, with this one, we do have longer periods to provide nutrition education. So the delivery of nutrition, the nutrition education is slightly modified. Uh, we also have a longer period of time to actually collect evidence and see what is happening uh, with the different kinds of modalities at the different stages. So uh, right now they're collecting the end line and I'm sure more information in terms of learning and knowledge will be provided by the FAO Somalia team and the team leading that. But we are also working to link, um, there's a lot of re resilience activities that are also happening in FAO Somalia. And we are working closely with the team to design messaging and tools. So for example, we are working to support nutrition sensitive value chain and make sure that women are included and messaging around that is very nutrition sensitive. So if it is a fisher folk, we, we plan to support with nutrition campaigns around consumption of fish, design tools that are geared towards consumption of fish for children, for women, selection of fish in the markets. So definitely it is possible to connect um, emergency with longer term intervention. Thanks, Emma. And another question for you is in which dialects were you able to use the messages that you worked with in Somalia? Yes, so we did have the Mai, uh, the Maha, and one that I can't pronounce properly, I need to read it out. It's called the, the Rawain. I think that's, that's how it's called, but the Mai and the Maha are the ones that I know how to pronounce. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Emma. Um, going back to Issa, Issa, we have a question for you regarding the farmer field schools. And uh, if you also used the junior farmer field schools to train school students on agriculture and uh, potentially on food and nutrition education. Thank you for uh, this question. If I understand, is it how we can use the farmer field schools trainers to train students, right? Yes, junior farmer field schools. Yeah, actually, we, we have not, uh, for the while, experienced this kind of, uh, of interaction between the community and uh, other actors, but it's, it is a, a good, uh, it may be a good thing that we are going to try to, to experience in the coming programs. But uh, as I said before uh, ending, the demonstration fields are for everyone. And at community level, sometimes they are not even far away from the school. And uh, at the time we are doing this kind of sensitization, the field schools, it is the rainy season. And the rainy, at the rainy season, we do not have students going to school. They are all in the farms helping their fathers. So we assume that they can, they can take advantage of the sensitizations and the trainings we are giving to their fathers. But officially, not yet for the while, we are not going to, we are not training in schools. But we have started to train networks of social uh, media activists on education uh, in nutrition. And also we have a network of journalists and uh, so that they can widespread these terms of uh, education and nutrition. Thank you for this great question. Thank you, Isa. And then we have a question that I understand are for both of you. So it's in terms of assessments that were used for the definition of the activities. Isa, you already mentioned that. I don't know if you wish to also mention um, if uh, that supported also the development of the content uh, of the material. So I'll start with you and then I'll go to Emma. Isa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I think that I have mentioned the, the monitoring side of uh, education in nutrition as a challenge because we have many uh, I mean, we have many programs that we are running together, that we are carrying out together, and each program has its specificity, okay? So 
we, we for the while we do not have a, a multi-sectoral tool of assessment that can give us the result globally in a holistic manner. But sectorally, we have the capacity to monitor and the changes, and we are doing it. So for the while, it is by sector. Okay, thanks. Okay. So you're mentioning more the monitoring and evaluation part um, of, 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 the, of the issue. As, as, a, as a, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you, understood. So the same question to Emma. Emma, in terms of the assessment to start with for the actual um, development of the food and nutrition education component, and then in terms of the mini, we have questions regarding that. So taking advantage of Issa's reply, what have you been using to uh, measure changes and measure impact? So in the initial development of the tools, we did have uh, the first step, which was for us to, it, it came, nutrition education came up as a way of addressing nutrition within the larger emergency program. So we reviewed and, and looked into the whole, the delivery of the whole emergency program, what was the expected outcome and output and where nutrition could come in so that we actually see changes in nutrition at an individual level and not at a community level. So one of the large greatest strategies that was identified because of the gaps in the assessment, there was gaps in um, milk and meat handling, there was gaps in not knowing what exactly to feed the child. So in the assessments, those are some of the things that we picked from it and selected nutrition education as a strategy for addressing some of those needs. Um, in, in terms of need, there was a needs assessment that was also done, and uh, the needs assessment was done in uh, reviewing all the education and training tools that were available in Somalia and being used by different organizations, different agencies, looking at the gaps in knowledge, uh, what information does this one have that can be beneficial that is not included into this. So the, it was a very rigorous process that took uh, a full year to do so that we can actually see uh, what we can do in terms of uh, addressing nutrition through nutrition education. Um, uh, in, in terms of doing assessments and measuring and monitoring, we have just collected the first round, um, the first round of uh, data on minimum dietary diversity for women. And we have found that it is at 57%, while at the national level, the minimum dietary diversity is at 37.1%. So we need to go to another level to identify if, if this is actually can be attributed to the combination of nutrition education, livelihoods and cash assistance, or are there other factors that are also playing a role in terms of seeing this big difference um, with the relation to the diet quality of the women in the, among those who we target as beneficiaries. Thanks, Emma, that's very clear. And we have another question for you regarding targeting. So it's understood that you use IPC phase three and four to identify the overall beneficiaries. But the question is, um, how do you do to identify the beneficiaries for each component, let's say, of the, of the intervention, meaning the agriculture, the cash, and the nutrition, and the food and nutrition education? Over. So yes, so in, in terms of uh, beneficiary selection, we do target IPC3 and 4. Um, but at an individual level, we work with the community. So there's a lot of consultations that go into identifying who is the most vulnerable within these communities. Um, I, I would like to mention that for identifying the most vulnerable within the communities that we support in Somalia, we, we do have vulnerability being defined differently by different communities. And so that is why we have a very rigorous process of consulting with the village elders so that they can be able to identify which are the most vulnerable households within that community. Um, and But are they, these are huge selection criteria that looks at who are the, the IDPs within these communities. Um, we, we target a certain number, percentage 40% of women, um, female headed households. So there's a lot that goes into identifying the specific household 
that will be provided with that emergency support. Thanks, Emma. And a follow up to that. So, so once those beneficiaries are identified, they will receive all of the different components of, of the intervention, meaning the cash, the, the agriculture support, and the access to food and nutrition education. It's, it's for all of the beneficiaries of that intervention, or would that also differ within? The, 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 they will receive the cash, the input package based on the livelihood zone, as well as the nutrition education. So it's a, a full package on its own. Thanks, that's, that's very clear. Um, going back to Issei, so we have um, uh, an experience here shared by FAO Niger that worked mm -hmm. on a framework of a new production initiative with the production of legumes, including Niebe, and we all who have been in Niger um, appreciate uh, that uh, legume, and um, in collaboration with ACF, and this is um, in a global approach with WFP. Um, in the framework of the strategy of local purchases and better nutrition at the community and the school levels. Does this approach um, instill inspire ACF? Okay, yes, but uh, need to be think about because uh, there is one notion inside which is the local purchase. The local purchase was a program initiated by the former president of Niger, uh, Tanja Mamadou. And uh, it shows its limits, all right? Because at, we are encouraging, at, at action against Tanga, we are encouraging people to produce what they are going to eat during all the years. But once, we have a program of purchasing, for instance, Nyebe. People will be like they are going all to produce Nyebe because of the value money, and they are going to forget other useful products for their own nutrition. That's one problem. The second problem is that they will want to, to sell all their quantity because they, it's easy for them to sell this quantity. So they will go back to the market to buy what to eat. You see, I don't know if you understand my, my English. We have two problems at this level. People will go, will, will forget about other productions. And second, people will sell all their production because once they see the money, they will buy. So we need, yes, of, of course, we are inspired by any action which improves the production of nutritious product, products in, in the area. But the aspect of selling is one question about which we need to reflect and take a decision. We are helping people to improve and diverse their production so that uh, they can tackle uh, the nutrition matter. But if you come back, and sell what they are producing at a localized scale, because it is not a very wide area, this is going to cause a problem. Thanks. This is the sorry, idea sorry. is good. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So if I understood, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of balance between selling and, and income generation, and then the actual consumption of a diversified diet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, I would have a question um, for you, Isa, waiting if we have any other questions coming in in the chat. Um, regarding the actual development of the content of the food and nutrition education, is it, do you have a standard uh, package? Is it a standard material that you would use uh, uh, to compound in the different types of interventions of ACF in Niger? Or is it uh, developed uh, uh, or tailored to each specific type of intervention, meaning the water and sanitation or the food security? How do you actually um, develop this and compound it with your different interventions? Okay, since uh, the last two or three years in uh, 
the, the ACAS program in Niger is going towards multisectoriality. Multisectoriality for us means that every time we have a project, this project should have all the components, be them little, because we are aware that no program taken apart solely can produce effect. To produce effect, we need to have a complete package of intervention. That's why we are always running into multi-sectoral programs for the population. So at the very stage of designing a program, we include health and nutrition aspects. We include food security and livelihood aspects, and we include water and sanitation aspects. Both of them have uh, the transversal aspect of community mobilization. So that's how we are tackling this issue of some, some projects are, they are always short, pro, short term projects, but with the short term pro, programs we have, we are scaling up. It means that if we, we fail to find pro, uh, one program of uh, five years, three years, we are managing with the short term programs to, to take a little bit time, two to three years in an area, a defined area, and giving them programs, complete programs. You see, that's how we are tackling this, this program. Thank you, Isa. Um, thanks, Emma and Lisa, for the replies. I'd like to call in Anna Islas if you'd like to react to any of the points or if you have any complementary ideas you'd like to share. Thank you, Diana. Thanks. Uh, I have actually a question for Isa um, regarding uh, the the selling and the purchase, which is something we see commonly. But uh, have you done any assessment of what are the needs that are being addressed by by the selling of all the production, the specific needs of the households? What do they use the money for, and and what is it that this um, this, uh, this is actually addressing um, and um, uh, what other barriers have you identified to um, uh, diversifying the production in, in that context? Thank Anaislas. Over Thank to you, Anna, uh, Anaislas, uh, for uh, this question. Uh, in fact, we do not have a, we have of course, uh, many evaluations of how the market is uh, reacting in Niger. Uh, we have uh, many market evaluations. My point was that as action against hunger, we cannot encourage people to sell their production. If we change, their production to value, to money value ones like Nyebe, they will sell it, of course. And this population will have to go back to the market to buy what they need to eat. So this approach of selling, of creating them or easing them the opportunity to sell all that they have that we, we cannot support as action against hunger. We need them to produce nutritious and diversified food and to be able to maintain this food in their households. That's why we are carrying out, at the same time we are promoting their production. We, we, give, we bring other projects like VSLAs, like uh, income generating activities, so that these people will not have will not be obliged to sell what they have produced. You see, we, we have a holistic programming, even in Mayai. It is not only a, a support to the production to improve and diversify the 
action it is also an actions to to protect and promote the livelihoods of this population they will have to sell but yes of course they will earn money through vsla activities through income generating activities that we are helping them to have so if i may so, I thank you isa i know yeah go ahead no i was tackling the, the second question but you have uh, if you have a point on that yes no i think that that is, is actually a great example thank you isa of uh, really going a bit deeper because of course households act in their own best interest right and so if we have a behavioral uh, approach where we really try to understand what is underlying the what we see that they are doing for instance in this case selling uh their their production it's because possibly they gain more by selling than by producing themselves and it's it's just logical that they the, in their value system, that is something that, that they would prefer. So addressing it by including other uh, livelihoods uh, uh, um, uh, parts, interventions, then you are addressing the underlying need, as you are saying, of, of, uh, of getting this, this, uh, these resources that are very needed by the households. So in that sense, it's a, it's a great example of going a bit deeper, understanding what is it that households are needing in terms of behavioral aspects and, 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 uh, and the behaviors that they are, are exhibiting. Thank you. Thank you, Anais. Is there any final comment? No, for the one. Thank you. Um, we have one last question. Um, Emma, if you could kindly try to answer in the chat, because I don't think we're going to have time to address, um, is if um, the standard agriculture, if what were the impacts of the trained agricultural officers? And if they have a standard agriculture and nutrition guideline or framework. In the meantime, um, dears, we, we have one minute left. So um, fortunately, we'll have to stop taking questions. I'd like to thank um, so much the participants for the active uh, uh, engagement in the discussion. I think it was a very interesting discussion. Thank the presenters for the great presentations. And I think it was very interesting for us to see um, first, the, the possible steps that can be uh, taken uh, into account for the nutrition, for the food and nutrition education in emergencies, and then seeing two um, extremely important examples um, of country uh, experiences, one in Somalia and one in Niger, that actually go into the details um, of, of what had been suggested in the first presentation regarding the targeting of the participants, the development of the content of the food and nutrition education, the themes addressed, the preparation of the facilitators and the channels used. No? Um, and I think some, some points came out very importantly. One, uh, the importance of the liaison with the clusters, um, including with the nutrition cluster, the incorporation of the existing material in, in infant and young, young child feeding, um, but also on the other hand, the support to the multi-sector approach um, um, to nutrition, integrating um, food and nutrition education in agriculture interventions and the capacity development of the agriculture stakeholders and some challenges and particularly in addressing trauma in emergency situations and the importance of the support to, to mental health. Um, and most of all, the importance of regularly integrating food and nutrition education in emergency program and beyond um, in, in longer term uh, programming at country level. So with that, um, I thank you very much. I hope this was useful for you. Um, I'd like to thank also um, all of our colleagues who um, supported this webinar, um, including the country offices, the core team, and the nutrition education team. Um, as um, was mentioned in the beginning, the recording of this webinar and the previous one on resilience will be, be available shortly in the core website. And as you leave the meeting, uh, you will see automatically on your screen an evaluation of the webinar. Please do fill it out. It's very important for us to have your feedback. 
Um, thank you so much. Uh, thanks the former moderator as well and have a great rest of the day.